Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series entitled Christian Education. And this is lesson number one in that series entitled Education in the Garden of Eden. Boy, don't you wish you could have been there for that. This is the lesson for October 3 of 2020. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is once again to open your word, to think your thoughts behind you, and to ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us as we seek to better understand the issues in education. May those who listen in also benefit as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. I don't think I need to tell any of you out there that the educated world believes in evolution and ignores or rejects the story we are studying this week. Even many Christians regard the first 11 chapters of Genesis as myth. Now that doesn't mean they absolutely believe it's completely false. Myths are, in, in biblical terms, are, are, are stories that are, that are told for, for, to teach good lessons probably. They may be true or they may not be true, but we can't, they probably didn't really happen. That's the general attitude. By contrast, most Bible students know the story of Genesis 1 to 3. What could we possibly learn from this very familiar story that we have not already discovered? Carrie? The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. An as an illustration, rather, of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book, the Creator Himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. That comes from L.M.G. White, Education, page 20, paragraph 1. Going on, I saw that the holy angels often visited the garden and gave instruction to Adam and Eve concerning their employment and also taught them concerning the rebellion of Satan and his fall. The angels warned them of Satan and cautioned them not to separate from each other in their employment, for they might be brought in contact with this fallen foe. The angels enjoined upon them closely follow the directions of God uh, the directions of God, sorry, had given them for in perfect obedience only were they safe. And if they were obedient, this fallen foe could have no power over them. Again, Mrs. White, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, Chapter 20, Paragraph 1. Page 20. Paragraph. Page 20. Yeah. Sorry about that. Try to imagine what it would be like to have a school in which God himself was the main teacher and the angels were his assistants. You think we would get a good education? <laughs> Put in that way, it is hard to imagine why Eve and later Adam yes. would have chosen another teacher. How much original knowledge, I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but how much original knowledge do you think Adam and Eve had? God must have instilled many skills, like how to walk, for example, just simply. Maybe information of various kinds in their minds at the point of their creation. I'm sure he didn't start out with them knowing absolutely nothing, having to learn everything themselves step by step. But there was nevertheless an enormous amount of knowledge that they should have learned. What we have recorded is a very brief description found in Genesis 2, 7 through 23. Uh, let me just read that. When the Lord God made the universe, there were no plants on the earth. This is uh, starting with verse 4, on the earth and no seeds of sprouted because he had not sent any rain and there was no one to cultivate the land. But water would come up from beneath the surface and water the ground. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils and the man began to live. Now that's the correct translation of that passage. It's not a man became a living soul as it says in the King James. There's nothing about soul in that verse. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man he had formed. He made all kinds of beautiful trees grow there and produce good fruit. In the middle of the garden stood the tree that gives life and the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. A stream flowed in Eden and watered the garden beyond it 
divided into four, and beyond Eden, divided into four rivers. The first river is the Pishon. It flows around the country of Havilah. Pure gold is found there, and also rare perfume, perfume and precious stones. The second river is the Gihon. It flows around the country of Cush. The third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. And you know the rest of the story. God placed man, placed, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it, and God he said to him, You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to live alone. I will make a suitable companion to help him. So he took some soil from the ground, formed all the animals and all the birds. Then he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and that is how they all got their names. So the man named all the birds and all the animals, but not one of them was a suitable companion to him. Then the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, took, he took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. He formed a woman out of the rib and brought her to him. Then the man said, At last, here is one of my own kind. Bone taken from my bone, flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. So that's the, the story, what we have. So how long do you think Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden? Do we have any clues? <laughs> okay. Go ahead. The holy pair were not only children under the fatherly care of God, but students receiving the instruction from the all-wise Creator. They were visited by angels and were granted communion with their Maker, with no obscuring veil between them. They were full of the vigor imparted by the Tree of Life, and their intellectual power was but little less than that of the angels. The mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of Him which is perfect in knowledge, that is from Job 37.16, afforded them an exhaustless source of instruction and delight. The laws and operation of nature, which have engaged men's study for 6,000 years, were opened to their minds by the infinite framer and upholder of all. They held converse with the leaf and flowers and trees, gathering from each the secrets of, his, of its life. With every living creature, from the mighty leviathan that playeth among the waters to the insect moat that floats in the sunbeam, Adam was familiar. He had given to each its name, and he was acquainted with the nature and habits of all. God's glory in the heavens, in the innumerable worlds, in their or orderly revolutions, the balancing of the clouds, the mysteries of light and sound of, every, of day and night, all were open to the study of our first parent, parents. On every leaf of the forest, or stone of the mountains, and every shining star in earth and air and sky, God's name was written. The order and harmony of the creation spoke to them of infinite wisdom and power. They were ever discovering some attraction that filled their hearts with deeper love and called forth fresh expressions of gratitude. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53 and 51. Uh, page 50 and 51. Uh, can you back up a minute there? Uh, uh, oh, on every leaf and flower, uh, God's name was written. Mm -hmm. Would the, another way of saying that is, is a representation of God's character. Exactly. Okay, it, it, was, it, it was an inscription. Not it was just it was a, a revelation of the character of the Creator. Okay, I put that ex fairly extensive paragraph in there to suggest that they must have lived in the garden for a while. Yeah. They and. You know, I used to think when I was younger that Eve must have been perfectly fertile. And if she got pregnant very quickly, that means that they would have been limited to some, no more than nine months and they would be, have to have been out of the garden because obviously Cain wasn't born until they were out of the garden. But I really think uh, without being casual about this or flippant, I think God must have practiced birth control um, because they, if for them to do all the things that are mentioned in that paragraph, I don't think that could have happened even in nine months. Mm. Well, God did not leave Adam and Eve just to wander around, wondering what to do. They were given responsibilities. And no doubt, they enjoyed with great satisfaction being able to do what God had told them to do. 
The garden also provided them with a fabulous diet. So I don't know, I mean, what do you think? Uh, did God say, well, you ought to try some of this? Or look at how this tree grows. Or da da da, I'm sure you need to, you need to cultivate around this one or something like this or, or this one. Notice it needs more water than that one does. I'm sure there were things he's, every day he told them, you know, notice this, learn this, whatever like that. And imagine what kind of a diet they had. Hmm. Yeah. What kind of responsibilities did God give Adam and Eve? There must have been literally tons of great food available. What did they do with all of that? Did they share the fruit with the angels who came to teach them? That's, that's an interesting, uh, something to think about because there was a sin had apparently had not entered up till that time. No. And so you, did you have garbage at that time? Did no. plants? No. No, everything was fresh. Uh, did, the, did the fruit just remain on the trees awaiting, uh, perfectly ripe, awaiting for Adam and Eve to pick it? How Must did have. You, how did you absorb it? I don't think there was uh, systems under the ground that you had to get the truck in every no. couple of years or so. We, we have no idea how large the Garden of Eden actually was. Yeah. But one day, we will see that garden. But it was not over the whole earth. No, because no, it because it was a special place, and you go out of it, and then. And Ellen cool. White says in another place that if they had remained in the garden, he would the garden expanded. would have been expanded to accommodate for the the additional people. Okay, Carrie, I think you have something more on that. Yes. Yeah, okay. Let me try this over here. Transported with joy, he, meaning Adam beholds the trees that were once his delight and the very trees whose fruit he himself had gathered in the days of his innocence and joy. Now we should back up a second. This is talking about at the second coming. Okay. So Adam is reintroduced to the Garden of Eden. So he yes. sees the very trees and so forth like this. Go ahead. He sees the vines that his own hands have trained, the very flowers that he once loved to care for. Sitting there still after 6,000 years or yes. however many years. His mind grasps the reality of the scene. He comprehends that this is indeed Eden restored, more lovely now than when he was banished from it. The Savior leads him to the tree of life and plucks a glorious fruit and bids him eat. He looks about him and beholds a multitude of his family redeemed standing in the paradise of God. Then he casts his glittering crown at the feet of Jesus and falling on his breast embraces the Redeemer. Okay, I want you to hold a second there. We, I have a personal friend, and Jim, you know him, and maybe you do too, Carrie, um, that used to teach, and he asked us one time in a Sabbath school class, would it be all right for you to go up when you get to heaven and give God a hug? I think I'd want to be there a little before I did that one. <laughs> well, look at this. Is what it says? What does Adam do? Falls on his. Well, he he gives Jesus a big hug. Well, that I think I, uh, hugging Jesus is a little different. He's been down <laughs> here as to God, who who uh, hid Moses. Come on him. now, the, the Father is just like the Son. You you know well, he, that. Well, he says, "You've seen me. You've seen the Father." Uh, now, was he right. was he making a play on words, or was he ac was he be uh, accurate? I, f I figure somewhere there, there's going to be somebody giving us the lowdown on what. To do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, where where were we? Okay. He touches the golden harp, and the vaults of heaven echo the triumphant song, "Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain and lives again." The family of Adam take up the strain and cast their crowns at the Savior's feet as they bow before him in adoration. And that's from the Great Controversy, page 648, paragraph 1. And also it says, compare... Adventist Home. Adventist Home, page 541, paragraph 1, which has punctuation differences only. So in, in some of the modern... Uh, books that they have, compilations, they've gone through and they've adjusted because we, we have learned to punctuate things a little differently. Yes. That, that, there's no, no difference in meaning. They've just yes. changed the punctuation a little bit. Okay. So according to the Bible story, God created Adam, 
probably out of lumps of clay. Can you imagine trying to, you know, King James says dust. Have you ever tried to form anything out of dust? I mean, you know. Only get it clean, and that was very hard. <laughs> <laughs> so probably out of lumps of clay. Knowing Adam would need a companion, God had created the animals out of other lumps of clay. He then assigned Adam the job of naming or studying and categorizing all the animals. This is very important to understand. Adam had the ability to discriminate, to understand, and to judge the quality of the things he saw. This, make, this sets him apart from other animals completely. Yeah. And so Adam was just, wasn't just arbitrarily tossing out names here. He, he was giving each animal a name that was appropriate to it. And that means he had to look at it long enough and see its behavior long enough to, to say, well, this should be called thus and this should be called thus. It's interesting that God would give Adam the responsibility of naming the animals. I mean, he could have just arbitrarily said, this one is this, 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 this is what they're all called. Yeah. No, he said, Adam, you do it. Then he put Adam to sleep, took out a rib, and made Eve. Adam's response when he woke up and saw Eve was incredible. She must have been the most beautiful woman ever to exist. Of course, she was the first one ever to exist, so I guess... <laughs> Some Bible students try to claim that man is superior to woman because Eve was taken out of man. They seem to have forgotten that every man from that day until this has been taken out of woman. That's right. So ladies, it's time to speak your peace there. Stand up for your, for your rights and your challenges and so forth. But don't be self-centered. Yes. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. So what are we supposed to learn from this story so far? even though we're so far removed from it? Well, think about um, this issue. I, in the last two, three days, have been listening to something that came on um, um, a YouTube program uh, of a gen from a gentleman that is give a lecture, a long, very, very scientific lecture about what it would have taken to create the very first cell not talking about creatures and other things, the very first cell. And he just plain says it's completely beyond the, the, the thoughts and the abilities of anybody in the world today. We don't even have an idea how to try to do it. Yes. You know, he just says we're totally clueless. Well, that miracle, all that was involved, somehow or other, is coded in every single seed. Think about that. It contains the amazing power of life given to it by God. The flowers are not only beautiful, but also many have wonderful aromas. God didn't have to make the flowers smell nice. They're, it's good just to look at them. But he added the, the aroma. It seems to me it was all very highly organized. Absolutely. The question about that. The fruit cosmos. Cosmos, yeah. All, all of it, chaos. anything he's ever touched, it had to have been just, they didn't pull molecules out of the sky kind of thing. No. <clears throat> the fruit must have been exceedingly great tasting. I mean, I, we're, it's, a, it's a season of, of great fruit right now. There's yes. blueberries and raspberries, not to mention peaches and other things like this. And you all know that um, one time you, you get one that's really good and maybe the next one isn't quite so good. And, uh, well, I always struggle with that because you get one that's really good and think, man, i got to have another one. And, oh, that wasn't quite so good. Well, I don't want to remember that one. I'm going to take another one that was really yes. good. Yes. Pretty, soon, pretty soon you find yourself overeating. Well, the, uh, how could they have avoided eating too much? That was a good question. Well, you got to remember they were much bigger than we are. Yeah. Yeah, that's a point. You, if, you, if you make a person proportionally larger, Ellen White says Adam was more than twice as tall as men now living. Yes. Um, a six-foot person, if you were more than twice, that would be more than 12 feet tall, maybe 13, 14 feet tall, maybe 15 feet tall. He would weigh around 1,500 pounds. Yes. And Eve, maybe she was 12 or 13 yep. feet tall, would be... 1,200 pounds or something like that. Ladies, you don't have to worry about losing weight. <laughs> Not up there. 
Uh, okay. The, the size of the other creatures. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, did any of the angels assist God in any way of arranging the Garden of Eden? They came in regularly, quite possibly. They were learning, not? obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Did the birds love to come and sit on Adam and Eve's fingers? You know, my brother and his wife uh, had a, have a home that's up in the mountains. And they've stopped it now, but they used to put out big uh, hummingbird feeders. Yes. And they, they ha they've had some of the experts coming and looking at all the birds coming and going, hummingbirds just coming and going like that, estimating that they had maybe up to 200 hummingbirds feeding from those feeders. Yes. And if you went out and stood Here's the feeder in front of you. If you'd stand and hold your finger out just a little bit in front of the feeder and hold perfectly still, they would come and sit on your finger. Wow. Yeah. It was amazing. A hummingbird would come and waiting for his turn to get at the... Amazing. I've seen them. They'll come right up to a yeah. feeder, uh, right close to it, right yeah. next to you, but uh, to hold your finger out and get it. Like yeah. I've got a little bit of garden in front of my house, small red roses. Uh, the name I forget. Anyway, I've got uh, miniature geraniums, and the mm -hmm. hummers come in trying all of those. I don't think they get much out of it. But every time I see them, I marvel how come that little brain controls every twitch of the yeah. wings and yep. the feathers, and they can go any way. Floors forward and backwards. Any which way they want. Yeah. And so tiny, and it's that much jammed into that little creature. Oh, let me add you another one to that. You know the ruby-throated hummingbird yeah. flies across the Caribbean nonstop. Right. Wow. Right. And the energy that's Every spread. season. Yeah. It's amazing. But the, we, 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 I mean, he, would lose, he loses about half his weight flying across the Caribbean. Yeah. Well, was it necessary for Adam and Eve to till the soil in any way? Or could they just stick something in the ground that would grow? Well, did they have any fertilizer to apply? We talked about that. Was there any waste, you know? Did they need any fertilizer? Probably not, huh? Yeah, could be. Well, almost before we even have a chance to think about those issues, we come to Genesis 3. Suddenly, there's an abrupt shift in the narrative. First of all, we need to recognize that Satan had already been thrown out of heaven and down to this earth before God created this world. So we need to keep things in, in sequence here. Jim? Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated, and, he, and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and all his angels with him. American Bible Society, Good News Translation, 1992. It was very interesting to think about that. I have another friend who looked at this and tried to work it out and he said his way of understanding what happened here, this is a possibility, this is a speculation on human part, he said, probably during the war that took place in heaven, a war of ideas and so forth. There wasn't a war of, of bombs and, and missiles and guns and stuff like that. A war of ideas. The father probably stepped back, veiled, his, veiled himself out of sight. And when it was, seemed, when it was pretty clear that every, all the angels had made their choice, which side they wanted to be on, then he began to reassert himself and those people who were out of harmony with him said, it's time to get out of here. That's a possible explanation of that passage. Yeah, I don't think uh, they were thrown out. They just thought, this is, we're not comfortable here. Yeah. And, and they could go, uh, part of God's love is, is the freedom to, to make yeah. choices. And you don't make the choices with threats and intimidation and coercion and extortion. Well, so on the and devil so would like you to do that. Oh, yeah, that's his method. And that's what's wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did God allow Satan and all his angels to watch as he created our world? If they were cast down to this earth and he was already there when the Garden of Eden was made, did they get to watch the creation? Well, I, I think they did. And if you, there's another way to read Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. 
and the earth became a chaos in, yeah. in chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, and then what we have in, in this, in the Bar Bible now, is a story of recreation, mm -hmm. which then after the flood, another type of a recreation. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's, it, God is a teacher, and if you have, can uh, hold on to that thought and run that, your data through that, God is a teacher, he's an educator, uh, it, he's patient. I, I have a feeling, and again, this is my, it wasn't my original idea, that when the, after the third coming, when God comes, it's time to recreate the whole earth, he's going to say, would you like to see how I did it the first time? Day one, day two. There's no rush. We got yeah. eternity. I think he probably will say, you geologists, come and stand up right here. <laughs> watch. watch. Yeah. See how many of your ideas were correct. You're right. Well, what, 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 would the, what would Satan and his angels have thought as they watched God create this fantastic garden? What'd they think? Obviously, Satan demanded, demanded immediate access to these new beings, and I think that's why God is not making any more new beings, because Satan would immediately demand access to them. What is implied when we say that Satan was more subtle or cunning than God? That's what it says, more subtle, more cunning. Well, you know, Islam have a God that he's very uh, cunning. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a great trickster, mm -hmm. which is the antithesis of what the Bible would have you, to, properly translated, would have you understand. So, yeah. that's a... Well, before we move on, we need to ask ourselves one very important question. Why was the tree of knowledge placed in the Garden of Eden? Why do you think he placed both the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil right in the middle of the garden? Was God trying to tempt or test Adam and Eve? That is what almost everyone says. But notice these very significant words from Ellen White. The angels warned these very, uh, uh, the angels warned them to be on their guard against the devices of Satan, for his efforts to ensnare them would be unwearied. While they were obedient to God, the evil one could not harm them. For if need be, every angel in heaven would be sent to their help. If they steadfastly repelled his first insinuations, they would be as secure as the heavenly messengers. But should they once yield to temptation, their nature would become so depraved that in themselves they would have no power and no disposition to resist Satan. Now, listen carefully. The tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and their love of God. The Lord had seen fit to lay upon them but one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his will in this particular, they would incur the guilt of transgression. Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. In other words, what was the purpose of the tree? It was, to it was a protection. Uh, right. He said, Satan, you can't follow them all around, all well, over there going like this, pop out behind every flower, every tree, and so forth, you know, this, that, the other. No, God says, this is a protection. He's allowed only at this one tree. Should they attempt to investigate his nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them and to be content with the instruction which he had seen fit to impart. Patriarchs and Prophets, 53 paragraphs 2 and 3. So, the tree was not placed in the garden primarily to test or tempt Adam and Eve. It did give them the power of choice. It was placed there as protection by limiting the access that Satan will have to our first parents. Satan could not follow them wherever they went, trying to tempt them at every corner. The great controversy had already started and God knew what Satan was capable of doing. When God's early instructions to Adam and Eve, he was very clear. Carrie? Yes, I'm reading from Genesis 2, verses 16 to 17. He said to him, You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. That's from the Good News Bible. Well, as we know from 1 John 4, 8 and 16, God is a God of love. God is love. In order to have love, one must have 
freedom. And so God created Adam and Eve with the power of free choice. They could choose to obey it or disobey, and we know what happened. So why was it necessary for God to allow Satan to have that one tree in the garden? Was that one tree necessary to give Adam and Eve freedom? Well, Satan clearly sinned in heaven without any tree to tempt him. Yeah. So did Adam and Eve really need a tree? Well, God knew exactly what was coming. We do not know how much he told the angels, but the angels also taught Adam and Eve. And, of course, he made us, male and female, and with the capability of procreation, which Satan doesn't have. Imagine if Satan had the ability to procreate. He would fill the universe full of little Satans. It is very likely that the conversation between Eve and the serpent was longer than what we have recorded in Genesis 3. I'm sure that's true. What other things do you think the serpent might have said to Eve? Do you think he complimented her on how good she looked? I'm sure he did all sorts of subtle things to try to, you know, just put her at ease, make her feel comfortable, da da da. Well, notice this conversation, what we have between the serpent speaking on Satan's behalf and Eve. Jim? Genesis 3, verses 1 to 6. Now the snake was most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from the, any tree in the garden? Now, I want to stop there for a second. The King James gives a little bit different meaning, but this is the correct understanding of the Hebrew. In other words, he's saying to you, did God tell you you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? So he's implying that God has forbidden them to eat any, of course it was complete nonsense, but he, he's trying to, you know, sort of shock Eve. Did he tell you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? Well, of course not, you know. Go ahead. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat it and the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. Now, uh, there's no record prior to that that he, God said not to touch it. No. The serpent replied, that's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat. And she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some, of, some to her husband, and he ate it also. If we back up there, when the serpent says, you're not going to die, well, all no intelligent creatures up at that till that time had ever seen death. No. Yeah. And so they, if you look, uh, there's a statement that says, past performance is no indication of future results. Yeah. Well, that's uh, from his, the, the, Satan's point of view, in that a way true. it was true. Yeah. But then he goes on to, also, and he says, ah, but you'll be like God, knowing good from bad, or good and evil. Mm -hmm. That is also true. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see? So he takes it, but he puts a twist on it. It's deceptive. Yeah. You see? The deception is what, is what, what the hook is. It's like sugar coating of, uh, the cyanide capsule. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, what are we supposed to learn from this interchange? What do you think would have been the result if Eve had rushed to her husband or to God and asked about this encounter? Eve knew, think about this, and think about this, what it might teach us about temptation in our day. Eve knew that that tree had been there every day of her life. She had seen it every day because it was right next to, or very close to the garden, to the tree of life. There was nothing new about it. She knew it would be there the next day and she could come back and eat, it, eat of it if it was the right thing to do. But she apparently did not think of those things. She was overcome by the surprise of a talking serpent. And how often are we overcome? I mean, th the salesmen, they use this trick all the time. Oh, th the sale's going to end tonight. The, the this, the whatever, whatever. You need to take action right now. You know? So... Satan, of course, knew exactly what God had said about the tree. And in order to gain Eve's attention and mislead her, his first words were an accusation against God, saying that God had been lying. And how should Eve have responded? 
Well, let's step, let's step back a step or two and, and ask another question. What was Eve's first mistake? She shouldn't have been there. What was Adam's first mistake? He missed, should have missed her. <laughs> was it not that when they each realized that they were separated and did not immediately return to each other's company? We have a comment about that. The angels had cautioned Eve to beware of separating herself from her husband while occupied in their daily labor in the garden. With him, she would be a less danger than te from temptation than if she were alone. And some of you who are familiar with the, the teachings of the Protestant Reformation, you know that when Luther wrote his commentary on the book of Genesis, he said that if Adam had been tempted instead of Eve, he would have said no. <laughs> Obviously, he had a, a bit of a bias there. But absorbed in her pleasing task, reading on these words, of course, are from Ellen White. Absorbed in her pleasing task, she unconsciously wandered from his side. And on perceiving that she was alone, she felt an apprehension of danger. And she should have immediately responded. And Adam also noticed it. Deciding that he had sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and to withstand it. Unmindful of the angel's caution, she soon found herself gazing with mingled curiosity and admiration upon the forbidden tree. The fruit was very beautiful, and she questioned why, with herself why, had, why God had withheld it from them. Now was the tempter's opportunity. As if he were able to discern the workings of her mind, he addressed her, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Eve was surprised and startled as she thus seemed to hear the echo of her thoughts. But the serpent continued in a musical voice with subtle praise of her surpassing loveliness. So you see why I made the comment earlier about how good looking you are. His words were not displeasing. He, he, he went on, I'm sure. Instead of fleeing from the spot, she lingered wonderingly to hear a serpent speak. Had she been addressed by a being like the angels, her fears would have been excited, but she had no thought that the fascinating serpent could become the medium of the fallen Oh, Patriarchs and Prophets 53 and 54. Wow. You know, you mentioned about fear, but how much, did they, they had very little to, to be feared of, fearful about anyway. Nothing that, to that, be that, fearful about. No, I mean, it just doesn't, uh, you might want to look at that a little bit different, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, try to imagine yourself in Adam's place as Eve approached him with the forbidden fruit. What would you have done? Was it noble for Adam to support his wife in her mistake? Carrie? Okay. One of the greatest appeals... This is... Wait, did you get Adam understood? Or is that mine? No, that's I yours. I was 29. I've got myself... Okay, sorry. I thought I started 31. Try to imagine yourself in Adam's place as Eve approached him with the forbidden fruit. What would you have done? Was it noble for Adam to support his wife in her mistake? Probably. Maybe he didn't even think about it. He was so used to... Oh, I... I don't know. It's, it's well, read on. You, it'll, it'll give us some clues. Al Alzheimer's had not set in. It was <laughs> no, not a diminished capacity. The other thing that always struck me as being kind of peculiar, they always say the serpent is the most intelligent of all the beings, but I don't really... Funny. Yeah, but they, they, well, they taught to do one thing. In mm -hmm. the general, either squeeze you to death and swallow you or poison you. Yeah. yeah but they, you got to remember, it wasn't the serpent itself. It was Satan speaking through right, a serpent. Right. But he had had many years, uh, th perhaps thousands of years, to do his trick and, and swept. Remember in Revelation 12, 4, the dragon swept down a, a third of the angels, or yeah, yeah. Third of the stars of heaven. Anyway, Adam understood that his companion had transgressed the command of God, disregarded the only prohibition laid upon them as a test of their fidelity and love. There was a terrible struggle in his mind. He mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side. So he, see, he, had al he, he already he realized. Out, yes. see, she realized it, he realized it, and they both made the mistake of saying, oh, we need to be back together. But now the deed was done. He must be separated from her whose society had been his joy. How could he have it thus? That's from Patriarchs and Prophets, 
page 56, paragraph 2. Adam was not deceived in any sense. He knew right from wrong. However, he chose wrong. Wrong, wow. One of the greatest appeals of Satan was that by eating the fruit, they would become like God. But earlier in the story, Genesis 1.27, where we read it, it tells us that Adam and Eve were created to be like God. Did Adam and Eve know that they were like God? I mean, they walked with him in the cool of the evening. Yeah. They must have understood that. What, what did they think they were going to learn or they were going to gain by eating this fruit that they didn't already have? Well, while Adam and Eve no doubt had a lot of things to learn and could have continued learning for the rest of eternity, they failed the test. So now we have not only the challenge of learning what they had not yet learned, but also the challenge of reacquainting ourselves with God, His truth and the plan of salvation. God is ever ready to share His love, kindness, and knowledge with us. Are we ready to receive His gifts? Think of the incredible life and death that Jesus was willing to go through in order for us to be saved. The incredible number of lessons that we can learn from the life and death of Jesus is so great that we are told that we will continue to study the plan of salvation for the rest of eternity. Steps to Christ, pages 88 and 89. And I would really encourage you to get out that little book and read those two pages. Amazing. So what provisions has God made for us to regain our relationship with Him? 2 Peter 3, excuse me, 2 Peter 1, verses 3 to 11. God's divine power has given us everything we need to live a truly religious life through our knowledge of the one who called us to share in his own glory and goodness. In this way, he will give us the very great and precious gifts he promised so that by means of these gifts you may escape from the destructive lust that is in the world and may come to share the divine nature. For this very reason, do your best to add goodness to your faith, to your goodness add knowledge, to your knowledge add self-control, to your self-control add endurance, to your endurance add godliness, to your godliness and, and Christian affection add Christian. Excuse me, add Christian affection, and to your Christian affection add love. These are the qualities you need, and if you have them in abundance, they will make you active and effective in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who do not, those who no. do not have them, not have them are short-sighted that they cannot see and they have forgotten that they have been purified from their past sins. So, then, my brother. So then, my brothers and sisters, try even harder to make God's call and choice of your your. You. His choice of you a permanent experience. If you do so, you may, excuse me, you will abandon your faith. Never abandon you. <laughs> wow. You will never abandon your faith. In that way, you will be given the full right to enter the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good News Bible. So God has made provision for us to find our way back, to be helped back, to guide and direct us, whatever is need. He, 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 he give, he's given us the example of Jesus and so forth. So it's not like God hasn't tried to rectify what happened there in the Garden of Eden. So what is the specific knowledge mentioned in Peter's letter? Might it be the ability to distinguish between good and bad? Anyone who has gone to school for any period of time will know that there are some students who find school a lot easier than others. Knowledge seems to stick in their brains. So Peter warned us of what, uh, uh, of what we can expect to happen. 2 Peter 2, 1-17 through 17, False prophets appeared in the past uh, among the people, and in the same way false teachers will appear among you. Now I don't know whether Peter was talking about false prophets back way back in the Old Testament, or whether he meant there was already false prophets in the, in, the, in the Christian church. But anyway, they will bring in destructive, untrue doctrines and will deny the master who redeemed them, and so they will bring upon themselves sudden destruction. So what are they doing and to whom? They're bringing 
upon themselves sudden destruction. Even so, many will follow their immoral ways, and because of what they do, others will speak evil of the way of truth. And remember, the Christian message back in the early days was called the way. In their greed, these false teachers will make a profit out of telling you made-up stories. Does this mean this is a, the pastors are preaching for a prophet? Ever heard of that idea? For a long time now, their judge has been ready and their destroyer has been wide awake. And so the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials and how to keep the wicked under punishment for the day of judgment. And this is one, one of many, many verses to suggest that the judgment doesn't come at the point when you die. It doesn't come until Jesus comes back again. Especially those who follow their filthy bodily lusts and despise God's authority. These people are like dried up springs, like crowds, clouds blown along by a storm. God has reserved a place for them in the deepest darkness. The Good News Bible. Well, think about things that we need to learn from this story at the beginning of Genesis and from the plan of salvation. Might it be true that we need to learn not only how to avoid temptation, but also learn of the many ways in which God can help us do so and grow in his knowledge and will? I suspect that would be true. Adam and Eve committed a sin, disobeying a direct command from God. Do we do that in our day? If we disobey one of the Ten Commandments, is that a direct disobedience of one of God's commands? You know, when we use the term disobey and obey and so forth, uh, another way of saying that it's a, a willingness to listen or failure to listen, because all through the Old Testament, God is saying, you don't listen, you don't listen, and which, of course, you're going to be careful who you're listening to. Yeah. You want to t t test it out, but... Uh, yeah. Well, there are many passages of Scripture, especially in the writings of Ellen White, suggesting that our first work should be witnessing for the Lord. She talks about this. Uh, I listened to some more material just this week from her writings that we can do all kinds of different jobs. We can support ourselves. Paul made tents, but that wasn't his real job. What was his real job? His real job was spreading the gospel. And she says, no matter what your situation is, wherever you are, so forth, and that's why she has particularly tried to emphasize uh, healing messages because if people come to you hurting, uh, they want help, and so you're in a position to not only help them from a health perspective, but to help them in, in a spiritual perspective. Yeah. We may be busy in any kind of work, educational. We may volunteer. My wife has taken up a new volunteer job. Uh, ministerial work, or a host of other possibilities. But in each of those contexts, shouldn't we be witnessing for the Lord? And that's what we talked about all last quarter, wasn't it? Considering the craftiness of Satan, are we prepared to meet his temptations? I mean, think of someone who for more than, well, let's say for multiple thousands of years has been practicing his skills at tempting people. What are our chances against that? Satan is not omnipresent. However, God is. So we are physically close to God at all times. We do not know exactly where Satan is. What we do know is that good and evil angels are with each one of us. So we can be as close to God as we choose to be. So what have we learned about how we can discriminate between good and bad authority? Well, what are the most important lessons we can learn from Genesis 1 to 3? Surely it would be to watch out for the devil, right? <laughs> we can imagine ourselves walking in Adam and Eve's footsteps, thinking what we would have done in each situation. We can learn of God's enormous power in creating our world. We can also learn about the importance of authority and why it is important to obey good authority, which raises another question in my mind that I haven't ever asked anybody before. When they were kicked out of the garden, God gave them clothes made out of animal skins, right? Does that mean, we, we know they wore a robe of light inside the garden. Did they wear any shoes? Did they need shoes? If 
they didn't, they probably soon would have. <laughs> Things would have changed outside. They had to rethink their diet and all that kind of stuff. How did, uh, when did the thorns come in? Yeah. So forth yeah. and so forth, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Well, many parts of Scripture refer back to this story we are studying this week. What lessons are there in that for us, in, including Jesus? He talks about creation, calls back to creation. Why do we need to know the story of the Garden of Eden in order to understand the plan of salvation? Or do we? What do you think? I'm noticing a discrepancy between these numbers we've got here. Yeah, there are. Did you upgrade something? Oh, the, the computer program does that sometimes. Oh, I'm trying to find my way around right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> why do we need to know the story of the Garden of Eden in order to understand the plan of salvation? Or do we? I think we need to know the story of the Garden of Eden. We need to know, first of all, what Jim read us from Revelation 12 to know that the problem of sin did not start here, it started in heaven. And we need to know this story to realize that God planned for us a perfect environment, and we blew it. Yeah. And so that's how we got into this situation. And I think it's essential that we understand that. Try to think through Satan's temptation of Eve. How did he do it? He was, I'm sure he had subtle praise for her, you know, flattery, flattery yeah. this kind of stuff. Imagine and, a talking snake. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh... Yeah. And, you know, you don't, his mouth must have moved some, he didn't, they, snakes don't, snakes don't have vocal cords. But, uh, they make hissing sounds. I mean, if, if it was a, one of the big pythons that had a big head on it, you might see where yeah. they, he could have killed her into well, there was well, There was no fear at that, uh, at that well, time. And Ellen White says that in those days, the serpents could fly. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, and if you've seen one up in the tree and eating fruit and what have you, it's a... Uh, it, it just seems a natural thing yeah, to do. Yeah. Oh. Well, it was God's original plan, remember, for all of us to be living in the Garden of Eden and learning about Him every day. Someday, we may go back to doing that. Jim, I think you have the last one there. So long as they remained loyal to the divine law, their capacity to know, to enjoy, and to love would continually increase. They would be constantly gaining new treasure of knowledge, discovery, excuse me, discovering fresh springs of happiness and obtaining clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. Ellen oh. White, Patriarchs and Prophets. Okay, I, I want to ask some questions about that. Have you ever wondered how it can continue getting bigger? Some, some places Ellen White will say, you can reach the highest level, and yet there's more beyond. Well, if, it, if there's more beyond, it can't be the highest level, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm sure it's going to seem like that. My wife always teases me when we, when we, if we're climbing a hill or something like this, because I always think, oh, it's, we're almost there, and then we get to the top of that one. Oh, yeah, there's another, another ridge. There's yeah. another ridge, there's another ridge. But, I mean, it, it, the, the learning in heaven must be like that. And when you find something that it is really uh, you're attracted to, you you need more. Yeah. You, 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 you don't, aren't satisfied with that little bit you've got. You want to know what, what more does this per one yeah. have to tell us? Yeah. It's uh, that's true. Of, of, of visiting beautiful places as well. Yeah. You know, beautiful scenery. I just came back from visiting three different national parks, and boy, you just. You know, you go around another corner and there's this, and there's, a, there's an animal here, and there's a beautiful tree there, and there's, you just, you blink your eyes a couple of times, you know, can I take this all in, you know? Yeah. It is interesting to know that, notice that each of Satan's accusations in this first recorded conversation are all directed against God. He implied that God is very restrictive. He, did he, tell, did he tell you that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? That was his, that was his question. Well, Genesis chapter 1, he, yeah. two places, he says, take dominion. Yeah. 
And he didn't say, hey, I'll hold you back. I've got this barrier. No, just no. To, to take control. Okay. And he didn't say, well, but look out. You yeah. step out of line. Yeah. I'm going to zap you. It's not there. He almost suggests that God forbid them to eat from any of the tree. He implied that God feels threatened by someone else trying to gain a knowledge that might impart to him or her powers equal to his. I mean, what is God going to spend the rest of eternity doing? He wants it to become more like him, right? That's our goal. That's God's goal for us. Philippians 2, 5, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That this mind be in you is yeah. in Christ Jesus. He further suggests that God had deceived them and misinformed them about the lethal consequences of eating the fruit from the tree. So what should we have learned from this lesson? Are we clear about God and the answers to all of God's accusations against God down to the generations? That's an important thing for us to consider. What do we know about Satan's accusations? Do we understand them? Well, God placed Adam and Eve in a free universe. There was no embarrassment. There was no shame, even though they were naked. When God approached them after their sin, he did not make accusations against, accusing, against them, accusing them of sin, rebellion, or iniquity. He simply asked them, where are you? And then he had to reveal to them the awful truth that they would be expelled from the garden. How many of Satan's initial accusations against God are still popular, popularly believed today? Do we understand clearly that God hates only one thing, sin? He hates sin because it damages and destroys his children. There are many variations on sin and sin in many ways in which we can disobey God. We may often have to hear the questions, what's wrong with doing this or that? Do we recognize that these questions are really an attempt to smear God's reputation? There's a story told of an ancient nobleman who lived on the top of a mountain. On the road up to the top, there were some very narrow sections of the road. He wanted to find a driver who could safely carry his wife up and down the mountain. He had three applicants. He asked the first one, how close can you to the edge of the cliff do you think you can safely drive? The first driver suggested that he could drive within one foot of the edge and still be safe. Then the nobleman asked the second driver how close he thought he could drive to the edge and still be safe. Uh, thinking that he would have to sound better than the first driver, he said he could drive within six inches of the edge and still be safe. The third driver then asked the same question. He turned to Nobleman and said, the only safe place to drive on this road is as far from the edge as one can. Who do you think got the job? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, help us to stay as far away from sin as we possibly can. We don't have trees that we... We were forbidden to eat from, but as Eve walked, wandered over there and saw that tree and she was tempted, and look what terrible things it has have been the result. And even today we're tempted. The Satan, Satan will have us try to, to be misled and deceived, help us to be aware of his wiles. May we, closely, may we draw closer to you each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.